Uh, welcome <coughs> back from our little short hiatus for the uh, departmental seminar series. It's great to have everyone back. Today, Max Ed and I will be reporting on our recent trip to South Korea for the uh, Environment and Sustainability in East Asia Study Tour. So, Max. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Maxine Kapslov. I'm an honours student in politics and economics, um, which is bags of fun. I went on the trip to China with Ben two years ago, so in 2015, and then was awarded the scholarship to come on the trip as part of a leadership capacity, um, which was a really great opportunity, something I had to jump on. Um, yeah. <coughs> yeah, cool. So we'll go through... Uh through the motivations for the tour, how we structured it up, uh, assessments, that kind of thing. Then we'll go through some of the highlights of the itinerary and then some of the learnings at the end. So we'll run through it reasonably fast. It's visually spectacular with lots of photos from the country. So really happy to field some questions and, and comments uh, at the end. So we'll have plenty of time for, for Q&A. Uh, so yeah, as Max said, this concept of the study tour dates back three years. We originally went to China in 2015 and 2016. Max came on the first trip. Uh, it started out as a brain bubble over coffee with my collaborator at Series Global, <coughs> Ben Walter. Uh, he heard I'd been to China. He's lived in China. We had a mutual friend. We had a coffee and said, you, you, you want to go to China? And I said, yes. And that's how it started. All good things happen over coffee. <laughs> uh, so our leadership team this year, uh, we had myself and Ben, Maxine of course, uh, we had Jess Love who was our videographer for the trip and who's going to be making a video uh, which will be debuting when Series Global have their information night uh, later in October. And one of our alums here, uh, Ron Petz, who's currently in Seoul on a Hamer scholarship, uh, helped us out with some itinerary building including one visit uh, to a site in Incheon. Uh, these are uh, tour groups from past years, that's the 2015 group and the 2016 group. Why we study environment and sustainability in East Asia? Well, it provides a great contrast to what's going on here in Australia. Uh, because of the kind of population pressures, uh, the rapid economic development uh, and the pollution problems that are associated with it, they've got some of the most severe environmental challenges uh, in both China and South Korea uh, that are going around. But also, because of those challenges, they've got some of the most interesting innovations in that space as well, and a lot of stuff that we can learn from uh, uh, to apply here in Australia. And for our students, it's also, as well as learning about those things, it gives them a basis for comparison about how we do things here. I'd like to thank some of participating students for joining us here today. Anything you'd like to add on this one? Yeah, um, I think... Throughout my degree, I did look a lot at China and um, Southeast Asia in terms of uh, Australian policy and foreign policy. So obviously they're really important <coughs> because of our export industry, like some of our biggest customers. And so we're really implicated in their sustainability movements as well, which I think is really important. And the experiential learning that happens when you're in country is invaluable. So, yeah. yeah, it can't be beat. I'll take this one in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the goals of the study tour is one, that experiential learning component. Uh, what students learn in country on these tours just could not be replicated in the, the classroom environment just because of the total immersion uh, in the case study that you're looking at. You're, even if you're just walking down the street or in a subway or on, or on route somewhere, you are experiencing uh, sustainability or lack thereof uh, on a moment by moment basis. Uh, so that's why I enjoy this uh, experience so much. Uh, for me, as uh, one of the tour leaders, it also gives me a chance to uh, accomplish some research goals while I'm there, so networking, uh, doing interviews, that kind of thing. Uh, and that pays dividends down the line when I go back for field visits of my own. Is there anything you've got here? Um, obviously take home lessons as well, experiential learning is really good for that and I know for me, stuff I learned two years ago in China I still carry with me on a regular basis, it's yeah, yes. something good for the students to gain. So the type of students that tend to come on this trip are people, they have to demonstrate a, a prior interest in environment sustainability <coughs> issues and or the country that we're visiting. Uh, so our students are people who are going to go on to careers uh, 
in the field related to environment and sustainability. And this kind of experience, like it's great knowledge, uh, it's great resume stuffing, uh, any kind of in-country experience overseas looks great on a resume. So it ticks a lot of boxes simultaneously. Um, so I was offered this scholarship earlier in the year and didn't hesitate to accept it, obviously. I um, really enjoyed the China trip two years ago and, um, as I said, learnt heaps and took a, a lot away from it. So this was a chance to do the same thing again but in an entirely different capacity. So I kind of think professional development-wise it was really helpful because leadership skills are something you can't really learn at university as much as people try and sell it to you. I, um, you know, I think everyone's personality is different and it's really good to throw yourself into an experience like that, especially 24 hours a day for 14 days straight. It's quite intense um, and a bit challenging, but uh, yeah, I think I learned a lot about myself and my capacity as a leader doing this and the different requirements as well. And the uh, things I learnt were that one-on-one -on -one com uh, communication was really helpful, but also briefings as well. So touching base with the students without the bends around was good. I think that was kind of nice to give you guys a break and also to make sure I was getting like really useful feedback and kind of self-entitled well well-being officer was what I ended up <laughs> <laughs> deciding for myself. So yeah, it was a great experience. <coughs> and, um, yeah, we couldn't recommend it enough to anyone that was offered it again. Mm. So the, the context for this scholarship is we're budgeted for two La Trobe University staff uh, as part of the tour cost. So we take one staff member and then we've created this young sustainability, sustainability leader scholarship position where we identify someone uh, with proven track record who's come through the system, uh, someone who's ideally been on our trip before, so Maxine's uh, been in 2015, and that position arose as something that we learnt in the first trip when we had uh, Alex Herkham, who's another graduate of the, the BIR program, who came along and in an unofficial capacity uh, acted as a, a leader of sorts and as an intermediary between the undergrad student cohort uh, and the senior people in the leadership team, and that proved to be a really important position. So last year we created a, a position description for this role and really formalised it. Uh, and that's where we had Lily Falconer, who uh, many of you know is another honest student in the program, who fulfilled that role uh, last year. And then, of course, Maxine's taken it on this time around. So this, this position's become a really important component of the leadership team and uh, you know, something I can't recommend enough. It uh, gives an opportunity for a young up-and-coming up star to get some leadership experience and it performs a really important role for maintaining group harmony while we're away, which is really important. So the pre-departure preparation was, we caught up a couple of times to chat. The first was a, hi, how are you? This is admin, you know, forms, stuff to fill out. This one here was a little bit more learning focused. So we ran through the assignments, obviously, and um, also things to plan for whilst you're away. Sustainable travelling is nigh impossible, especially in places like big cities in um, Southeast Asia. So we really sort of nutted that out and made plans for um, preparation, like bringing your own drink bottles, uh, figuring out how to source safe drinking water without having to buy plastic bottles multiple times a day, um, and obviously food waste as well. So this is something we all went through, and that was really good for getting the student's head in the game um, and kind of thinking about this in a real... Um, ex existential way, I think. Uh, so that was really good. And also getting to know everybody. This is obviously was a bit more of a fun day than the first departure <laughs> meeting, get together. Um, so as you can see, everyone was in a way better mood. <laughs> and um, I really found that small groups especially worked for people getting to know each other. Because obviously most of them sort of knew one or two people, but um, getting into groups of three or four was good for people having conversations and... Um, you know, sort of mitigating that pre-departure anxiety that you no doubt have when you're going with a group this big. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so we really emphasise the team building component when we're structuring the activities for these pre-departure sessions because uh, that cohesion pays off when we're away uh, just with the raw logistics of trying to get stuff done and move people around. Uh, moving a large group through a big city uh, when it's really hot and everyone's sweaty and stinky and tired, that's difficult. Uh, 
but it's much easier when everyone's on the same page and everyone's feeling a, a sense of camaraderie and obligation to one another. Uh, this was in the, the old Red Railway carriage that's in series, so we had our second uh, meeting there. We had the first one here in, in TLC, and that was just all about, uh, this might be a lesson for you, Alex, getting all of the forms, every possible bit of <laughs> bureaucracy that had to be done, we filled it out as a group together, and then we had our uh, representative from the Trove International, and we said, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, Someone still managed to fuck up a couple of the enrollments. <laughs> uh, so even despite our best efforts, uh, bureaucratic errors did occur, but we fixed them. So that was a okay. Saturday too, wasn't it? Yes. So there's admin staff here on Saturdays. Just... Oh, that was a Friday. That was in the mid-semester. Oh, okay. This one was a Saturday, yeah. Okay, so now we'll have a quick look at some of the highlights of the tour. And we, the kind of engagements we had were we had some academic seminars. We had some organisational engagements. Uh, and we had some site visits to interesting places. So triangulating different kinds of engagements through the tour was uh, something that we really tried to concentrate on. Uh, this is our full itinerary. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty packed. One of the things we learned from our first trip was not to try and pack too much into any one day. Uh, something in the morning and something in the afternoon uh, is fine because it takes time to move people around uh, between visits. So. Uh, and it's very tiring, it's really hot at uh, that time of year in South Korea, so you don't want to overburden people. So you can take it away. Yeah, this is one of the very first engagements we have, and um, it was at Yonsei University with um, Kim Joo Jin, who's actually an international lawyer in climate policy. And so he had some really interesting avenues and ways to explain how policies developed in South Korea. And I think the most notable take-home lesson for me that day would have been the impacts of um, air pollution, something we don't have here, um, but actually it's probably one of their key drivers in policy. Uh, so, yeah, having again, having that kind of interaction. He knew next to nothing about Australian climate policy, but um, in sort of hearing what he had to say about South Korea's experience, you can see the context for Australia's as well, which I thought was really good. Yeah, and it was really great that we provided a, a contextualisation of the legal framework around carbon pricing and climate policy in Korea, uh, which was great to have as the first engagement that we had because it set the scene for everything else that we saw afterwards. And really proud of the group because they asked really excellent probing questions uh, of Dr Kim, which was awesome. He actually brought that up, didn't he? Yeah. That Korean students don't mm -hmm. ask questions. And so it was really... <laughs> but our students do. <laughs> yeah, we did. So that was great. I actually found that day was an interesting day for me because I'm kind of an outspoken person in general. And I had a couple one-on-one -on -one time with both of them and I think they were quite confronted by me and how I was a mm. bit... <laughs> talked about my government in a kind of derogatory way. Uh, so that was an interesting kind of experience for me. I didn't really know how to deal with it either because you want to be respectful but at the same time true to what you really think and feel. Mm. So... Mm. Right, our second academic engagement was a seminar at the Institute for Far Eastern Studies, which is a place that's hosted me on previous research trips, uh, with Bernhard Seliger from the Hans Seidel Foundation. And the Hans Seidel Foundation, based in, in Germany, but they do environmental capacity building and other forms of aid and capacity building in the DPRK. Uh, so I've interviewed him before and he was gracious enough to come and speak to the group. Yeah, so he was a conservative economist, um, so he had some pretty interesting approaches to things. But basically, um, his argument was it was soft diplomacy through environmental policy work. Um, so he, he worked with a South Korean organisation and a North Korean organisation, although he worked mostly with German groups as well, um, and capacity building through something as simple as revegetating land. Um, but in the long run, that's basically your best avenue to diplomacy with North Korea and he was adamant that it's you've got to treat them as their equal um, so a partnership rather than you know <coughs> this more educated group teaching the less educated group um, and yeah he had some interesting insights into ecology of North Korea as well which is fascinating because they haven't had uh, access to a lot of the chemicals and um, pesticides we have so a lot of their ground is quite good still that hasn't been deforested but also the um, uh, bird population, they've got a lot of rare and interesting migratory birds, <laughs> which was really fascinating to learn. Uh, 
Yeah. There's not so many apartments in North Korea taking up their space, unlike on the southern side, which we'll talk about in a minute. Mm. Uh, this Hantalim is, this facility was about an hour and a half out of Seoul. Uh, and Hantalim is the biggest organic food cooperative in the world. Uh, something like 20,000 members or something. Oh, no, it's 50, 50, 50 to 65 as well. Yeah, yeah, encompassing lots of different uh, agricultural production chains. It's a multi-level co-op, so it's incorporating farmers and consumers in it. Uh, so we went to one of their facilities, that's a tofu factory. Uh, in the background, uh, and then they've got a, an office and headquarters just to the side where we had a, a great seminar presentation on how to live, uh, as well as the tofu tour. Mm. Yeah, I think they had an annual turnover about 360 million US as well, um, so it's really successful and basically blew the lid on most economic theory, um, being a co-op and, and non-profit driven. They had um, investment funds, so membership, part of membership payments went into a, a fund that pulled, um, you know, some resources together for if the harvest was damaged or for whatever reason. So these farmers actually had insurance. If things go bad, this company will actually look after them. So that's an incentive for them to sign up. Um, and yeah, and right down, the packaging side of things was not really, uh, hasn't really hit South Korea yet, but in terms of how the food production happened, super sustainable and um, super organic based and they're also quite political as well, so anti-nuclear campaigning and um, political mm. campaigning too. Anti-GMO, lots of environmental uh, campaigns. Incidentally, that's a love heart symbol <laughs> that we're doing there. Uh, one day we went to the Korean Federation of Environment Movement. So this is a, an organisation, it's an umbrella organisation for different environmental NGOs in Korea. And it's kind of loosely overseen by Friends of the Earth. So we got a contact through mm -hmm. FOE here uh, that hooked us up with Chuni Kim. Uh, Chuni Kim is one of the foremost environmental activists in South Korea. She's a veteran of the democracy movement of the 1980s. So it's got loads of activist experience and really was a quite inspiring figure. She not only taught us about the environmental situation, in South Korea, but told us about the candlelight democracy movement uh, that was pivotal in overthrowing or bringing uh, former President Park and hae to impeachment earlier in the year. Uh, it's just a shame it was so hot, a lot of us were finding it very difficult to stay awake. If you get this session. photo, you can actually tell. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she was an inspirational figure, and the story she was telling tied in a lot of other stuff uh, that we're seeing in context. Yeah, I kind of struggle with the Korean protest movement to understand it exactly because it's quite polarised but also kind of entrenched as well. Mm. And so hearing what she had to say, you know, the development over time was really interesting because it's still sort of quite a struggle but at the same time they've got a history of being really successful. I don't really understand the context of it. So that was good to hear her talk about it. But also um, federations of organisations... Um, meant that each group could, you know, um, jimmy up each other in terms of information sharing and campaigning across, you know, different fields, which was really good. Yeah, good approach. Yeah, yeah that horizontal networking in different environmental groups is, is something that's being modelled elsewhere in the world. It's a really effective way to, uh, to harness the resources of the, the whole. <coughs> Speaking of high-rise buildings destroying bird habitats, <laughs> this was the... Uh, the East Asian Australian Flyway Partnership Bird Sanctuary in Inchun. So we went to a couple of sites here. Inchun is just near where the airport is in Seoul, and site of the famous uh, UN forces landing during the Korean War. Uh, but this East Asian Flyway is a migratory bird pathway that goes from Siberia down the edge of East Asia and down here to Australia. So there's there's uh, bird sanctuaries on this flyway in Victoria as well. And migratory birds go all the way down there, including some that are critically endangered uh, that are using this spot. And this proved to be one of the more confronting engagements uh, we had on the tour uh, because of the all of this land that's part of the bird sanctuary has been sold off for developers and it'll look just like this in a couple of years' time. And there's no other places for these birds to go along the flyways. So that could be the end for some of these bird species. Um, the most interesting part of this day, I think, was the fact that it was organised by the Chamber of Commerce, who introduced it through their business um, relationships. 
So we had a guy from Woodside Energy um, do an introduction. And also uh, Rio Tinto were helping to fund the project as well. Um, so we had a gentleman from Woodside Energy, this guy here, Craig, speak to us to introduce the concept of you know, corporate responsibility. Um, being the kind of group we were, it was a little hard to swallow. You know, this is a, a company that's creating the problem with one hand and here trying to sell themselves as the saviour of us all. Um, and so it was a really emotional day because it kind of entrenched like how impossible it seems. This, this city was sold to me as an eco-city, so somewhere really cool and fun to visit where they've got all this infrastructure in place for food waste, etc. But it's built on one of the most important wetlands in the world. Um, so again, it's like another hit. <laughs> and also the um, breeding grounds we went to just in this middle photo. Um, Maggie, one of the girls in the group, pointed out to me that it was next to a freeway, so that could probably uh, really affect the breeding patterns of the birds. I asked the, one of the cons conservationists who was working in the area if there was anything to be done about that, and she sort of said the bird doesn't really, the, the, the noise doesn't bother them, it's more that they have to fly over the freeway to get to the ocean to get the food, drop the food, go down to pick it up, mums die, babies die, everyone's stuffed. And so I asked her, like, you know, is there anything being done to improve as a conservation effort? And she said, this land's been sold in three years. It'll be apartments anyway. So it was all a bit depressing, really. Yeah, there's a lot of Greenwash 101 here. Mm. Uh, and, but there were the group of actual activists who were working on this, you know, talked very candidly about the kind of pact with the devil that they'd had to, to make here to get the funding to actually do this work. And if they didn't have the support of Woodside and, and other corporate interests, then... Uh, they wouldn't be able to do that work at all. So it was, you know, it was no satisfactory, emotionally satisfactory answer to what was going on here. It was pretty deeply disturbing. Yeah, I think yeah. that the, the only thing that we had to offer them was solidarity, just like this. Yeah. We're, uh, we're kind of battling similar demons over here, but let's keep going, you know. It was, mm. yeah. Uh, if we go to our site visits here, we went to a place called Soul Forest, which is a bit like the... Uh, Seoul's version of Ceres Environment Park, uh, but it's a little bit bigger. Uh, I, it's another place that I've been in the past through my contact there, Jin Kyung, who spent time in Melbourne. I met her here and she helped facilitate this visit. So we got a tour around this park uh, and really good to see uh, something creative done with urban green space. This was built on a former uh, racehorse track on the banks of the Han River and now it's been completely regenerated into a, a productive green space. Uh, there used to be vegetable gardens there, but uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. You can see the breadth of the site, it's quite large. I think um, urban green space is a really important theme for these cities that I think we've covered in this trip, but not so much China. Um, so there are kind of, I think the Buddhist history of Korea actually sort of helps open up people up to this nature and human relationship, um, which is cool. This day actually I found really difficult. I think I, it was just one of those emotionally draining days. It was too hot and trying to take care of everybody, trying to find water for everybody was pretty strenuous. But yeah, it's an amazing place. Lots of different things going on right in the heart of Seoul. Uh, speaking of urban green space, there was two really interesting uh, regeneration projects that have taken place recently. This first one on the left is Solo 7017, which is right near Seoul Station in the downtown. This is a former uh, freeway overpass over the top that uh, only recently this year was opened uh, as a vegetated flyway space. Uh, a bit like there's one in New York that it was modelled on. Uh, it's not quite there yet, obviously it's very new, so a lot of the, the vegetation isn't grown out as much as it could be. Uh, but it's a very well peopled space and it's a place that people go to chill out. It provides a bit of a break from the hustle and bustle of urban life. And it's, and it's one thing we discovered while we were there that the working lives of people in Korea are so extreme and the pressures that they're under uh, in terms of working hours, in terms of the demanding work culture there uh, and other things that just taking five minutes to stroll through something like this is an oasis of calm that's really important to people's mental health and that, that point was made to us uh, quite clearly by a group of people who are running a, a little board games and rugs and beanbags 
uh, program just at the end of this pathway here. That was actually hammocks during the day. Yeah. But, um, workers in the area wanted to come and have a nap, <laughs> which was cool. And I ended up having a zero communication Jenga match that I won. <laughs> yeah. Um, the stream was, I really liked the stream. I found it kind of, it's this weird oasis that's quite cool. Um, temperature wise and a really nice place to walk and yeah people are, it's just filled with people taking photos and hanging out you know having family time you know boyfriends meet you a couple times that kind of a thing which was really nice to see in such an intense urban environment mm -hmm. the significance of the Changbe Chan here is that this used to be uh, a eight-lane freeway overpass uh, and a dump underneath where the river is now and during about 15 years ago when uh, former President Yi Myung Bak uh, was the mayor of Seoul. He instituted this program to remove the freeway and regenerate this and turn it into this uh, revegetated stream. So now it's one of the one of the nicest places in downtown Seoul. There's big fish in the stream, so it's actually a healthy ecosystem uh, with lots of plants. And again, it serves that social function of being a place of calm. The temperature feels about five degrees cooler than up on street level, just above it. Uh, and it's a biodiversity corridor, which is really important right in the heart of the city. What I did read in a lot of the essays with this particular campaign, though, was that the way it was built is not um, sort of consistent with how the stream used to naturally work back 100 years or so. So it's actually flowing the wrong way. And a huge amount of pump and like uh, concrete at one end is basically forcing the water down. Um, and a lot of the plants were introduced as well, so it's a really well-intentioned policy that wasn't really done with uh, conservation science exactly. You know, the, they, the couple of the groups and the t um, students on the tour did mention that in their essays, which was interesting. Mm. But it's better than what was there before, so mm. again, another one of these development trade-offs. This was the best day. <laughs> Um, so we ended up at this farm after getting on the back of a ute, which is probably like an oh and s disaster, but um, <laughs> it was really cool anyway. Um, it was probably my favourite thing that we did on the entire trip. This is the meeting point of two rivers. I don't remember it's what the North and South Han River and they converge and then it flows into Seoul yeah. about an hour away. It's a highly politicised um, place as well. It was almost sold to development. Um, but a group of really, really passionate um, activists moved in and they're campaigning to start an organic farm on this space here. Is that right? Yeah, just on the water. Which is interesting because it kind of shows it has to be commodified to be a viable option for the government. Um, whereas just naturally it was just a pretty amazing place. And one of the activists in particular did say, you know, this are two rivers that have different temperatures, different stream, different ecology and yet they meet and converge and you know work together and I think he that he kind of saw that as a really good metaphor for humans and nature as well um, so yeah bio biodiversity around that area was pretty amazing it was just a really great experience visiting them and the activists that are basically living there now yeah, yeah. and some of them had been arrested about four years later and put in jail for uh, their work trying to preserve this site it was Part of the controversy surrounding the Four Rivers project, which was a massive damming program that uh, was promoted under the previous conservative governments, uh, which was an environmental disaster. It ended up being stopped partially through the efforts of people at places like Dumulmuri here. Uh, but it, it illustrates another one of these uh, challenges about the role of development in the peri-urban fringe and what it's doing to ecosystems in places like this. This is such a gorgeous place. It's one of the prettiest places I've ever seen in Korea. Uh, but the confluence of the development pressure of people, population pressure of Seoul, so there's expansion of the urban fringe combined with property speculation and corruption means that places like this are being destroyed for apartment building. And the way that that land is being acquired is legal. Uh, and so there's real challenges with the actual enforcement of the legal system and the, the role of corruption in that space. But again, another highly emotionally engaging uh, site visit. Uh, Seoul Energy Dream Centre, this is a kind of a museum uh, devoted to 
documenting the ways in which the sole municipal government is instituting uh, renewable energy and green space programs. So this is right near the, the Seoul World Cup Stadium, um, where they have football matches. And it's, they get a lot of school groups coming through here, so there's a lot of interactive hands-on activity stuff. And, uh, but it's right on the, next to the Han River. And again, this was an industrial dumping site back during the developmental era in the 60s and 70s. It's been regenerated into this beautiful big park with food gardens, uh, lots of urban green space, uh, and again, it's a real jewel on the Han River. Uh, that's a contrast to the to the concrete built environment that's around it. I thought it was cool that it's a tourist attraction, so it's you know sort of a science and learning centre based on environmental movements and um, s renewable energy. And <coughs> there's a group of you know really young students, I think there have been about five or six that were going through and learning all about it, which was super cute. And um, yeah, that was kind of a little heartening and seeing that this is the future, hopefully, and one of the better things. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so just to wind up, we'll uh, use on some of our reflections from the trip. Uh, first of all, the, the video, this is going to be uh, really great. We've got Jess, she took uh, in-country footage from all of our engagements. Uh, she did some interviews with participants and is going to do some more reflective interviews uh, in the preparation of this video. So we'll have something that we can share with the students uh, that you can put in your CVs and say, are you a part of this thing? Uh, as well as to you know, demonstrate to the university and other stakeholders what we've been doing on this trip. We really wanted to document the learnings of this trip, so that's been really good. Uh, in terms of tour outcomes, uh, in addition to the kind of goals that I talked about before and the learning experiences for the students, I think one of the good outcomes to come from the three trips we've had so far uh, is that we get a lot of HDR students that come from the undergrad group that go on this tour and end up doing honours, like Max, like Lily, uh, and others. Uh, and yeah, for me as a teacher, to, to bring these people through as a mentor uh, is really satisfying, but it also means for potential HDR candidates, you know the quality of the people you're getting. Uh, you've worked with them int intimately in a, a difficult environment. You know their intellectual capabilities. And I think it's a really good um, source for you know, high quality uh, honours and HDR students down the line. Anything you don't know? um, Yeah, I think in terms of camaraderie as well, it's a really rewarding experience and making friends that are interested in the same things and also learning off one another. I think actually at this dinner table I was teaching the guys next to me about monopolistic competition in economics. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, in that way you kind of, you know, learn off each other and, and get new information and, and, and like me and Lily in particular, we went on the trip two years ago, like we're, we're best friends now, we, we, you know, are helping each other out with our thesis as well. Um, yeah, so there's a lot to come out of this, I think. Mm, because this is a multidisciplinary group, so we've got students from all, all colleges here. Uh, and that's really great for the learning experience, the wisdom of the group, because the students share with each other uh, their expertise. And you know when you go to a specific site and it's someone's field of interest, they really spark up and, and uh, get a lot out of that, and then they can share that enthusiasm with everyone else. <laughs> the tour is not without its challenges. Um, I chose this particular picture, one because it's cute as, but two, uh, it's taken in a subway, so this is when we were on our way back from Dubon Uh And the actual grind of travel is quite arduous, uh, and you know, herding a group of 20 people around a big city. Uh, can be difficult at times. Uh, we talked about how tiring it is uh, because it's the height of uh, summer in Seoul at the time. So you know, people are exhausted by the end of the day at these things. Yes. I'm going to win a prize. Should we submit it? What were some of the challenges that you've seen? I think the group was very cohesive. Um, which was a really big win, um, which probably had something to do with your, you know, choice, choice <laughs> list. Um, so I think the challenges for me was just that it's 
this is the most intense kind of travel you can possibly do. It's like sensory overload at the same time as having something to do all the time. Intellectually stimulating, sort of depressing as well. And um, yeah, you take solace in moments like that. Like, you know, we've already hung out a bunch of times since the trip, which is cool. Um, and yeah, I think just keeping the communication lines completely open and making sure as soon as, you know, a couple of times I'd saw the students were struggling with something, I'd latch onto them and you know, try to get them to tell me what was up, etc. Um, yeah, so it was tiring, so sleep and free time, essential. And just building on that, there's a pastoral care element that comes in the trip. Uh, because it's such an intense experience, because there's really deep relationship building that's going on here, uh, and because people are taken out of their normal life circumstances, it provides a space for the participants to really reflect back on what's going on at home. And so often that brings out really intense emotional experiences from time to time that you, you need to be aware of and hold space when someone's having an intense uh, experience. So that can happen. Uh, and you need to be ready for that. Uh, and often it ends up being one of the most powerful things that happens in a person's life when they get a chance to uh, reflect on that. So yeah, be aware of that one, Alex. That might happen <laughs> <laughs> on your tour as well. Uh, but if handled well, it can be a really good thing. Uh, so that's the conclusion of our remarks. Really looking forward to your thoughts and questions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the assessments. So oh, what yeah, students do that. and how does, how does what they, because there's stuff beforehand and yeah. stuff after, how does that all work? Yeah, so we've got a, beforehand they do a research essay. So they pick a, uh, Give them a fairly wide brief to pick something uh, associated with a key environmental sustainability issue in South, South Australia, South <laughs> Korea, uh, and research that intimately. So when we've got a site visit, uh, almost all of them, someone in the group has done deep research on that and can share that information. So it's good preparation for the trip. Uh, in country, we don't have any assessment activities related to that while we're there. Uh, my personal view is that the experience is such an intense learning experience uh, in and of itself is that you don't have to structure in anything formal through that. But then when they get back, uh, they have a reflective video presentation uh, that they compile based on uh, a set of uh, reflective criteria, so intellectual, uh, emotional reflections, uh, empowerment reflections, uh, and an existential reflection. So how, how has this affected them intellectually and emotionally, and what does that mean for how they're going to see their place in the world and do something about that? So there's a bit of an activist uh, component to what we want the students to come away with from that. Uh, yeah, so we're having our video presentation screening tomorrow night in this very room. Uh, and it's a nice capstone experience to the event. Yes, Cass. I was just going to say, on that, a lot of us were aware that we did have a massive video to come home to, though. So we were taking journals, and everyone had a camera or something out the majority of the time because we were terrified that we were going to come home. And yes. not. <laughs> so I think we were all kind of in assessment brain, like, you know, 30 to 50% of the time. And I think that was really helpful, sort of having that awareness there. So we're always sort of aware that there was stuff to be done on the other end of it. Yeah. But we did do some preparatory field work uh, activities in the final briefing <coughs> before departure, uh, just to give the students some strategies about so observational data, recording stuff, you know, note taking, that kind of thing, just to get the most out of the experience. I also did the marking, you know, co collab a little bit, but yeah, mostly it was me, which I think was a really good experience for me as part of the scholarship. Um, and um, the video, getting to watch that is actually really nice as, um, you know, seeing how the learning outcomes have come to fruition, which is really good. Yeah, Max and I spent a very fun afternoon on Friday in here watching all the videos and marking them, and it was fantastic for us to see the kind of creativity that the students according to the videos and, and what they've got now, which is awesome. And, um, so, uh, it's such a wonderful experience, you know. The, the, the problem, of course, is that it flies in the face of what is becoming the norm 
in higher education in Australia, which is these massive, you know, first year, second year, even third year subjects, with hundreds of students kind of crammed into lecture halls. Um, I wonder what, because I feel like we could, we have to get that message out. Not, mm -hmm. not, I mean, here I think everybody will agree that it's really important. Uh, but over the David Myers building, you know. Um, so I wonder what your strategy is in terms of kind of trying to get the message out, like whether it would be the video so that they go up somewhere, that there's a kind of repository, you know, some, some, some way of, I don't know, spreading the word, you know, so that, so that people, the bean counters over there now start to, 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 to wonder why, you know, your man hours are being used inefficiently. <laughs> I've got a, a couple of strategies for that. The one this year is the, the documentary video that we're making. That's meant for this mm. specific purpose. Uh, you know, to demonstrate the value of what we're doing uh, to the people that really can't be making the decisions. Uh, when I'm away, I always tweet pictures every day because I know there's people who follow me on Twitter uh, of importance uh, in the uni hierarchy, so I try and sort of slip that in there. So it's <laughs> noticed and that you, know, you can see from who likes and who's watching them. I write blogs about the experiences afterwards and publicise them. This stuff goes into my research and I talk about the trip in that way. Uh, so I want it to be as multifunctional as possible. Uh, and then with the institutional support of La Trobe Asia, it gets some publicity out of them as well. Um, yeah, but it's difficult because it is a small program uh, in comparison to other subjects. Uh, and it does fly in the face of that massification model that we're seeing. And yet it's demonstrably so far superior to that. Uh, you know, this is the best learning model that you could have. Mm. Oh, Maxine, uh, you also um, tutored in first semester, uh, and so that I guess that uh, was that helpful in any way to you then taking on the role? Like, yeah, absolutely. And, and would you sort of recommend that for somebody that would follow after you? It's not essential. Um, in fact, I actually found what I did with this group a bit easier because uh, right. it was less formal. Um, and I'm just the kind of person, once I get to know people, I'm really f sort of fine. Um, but in terms of marking and the responsibility, I think having had the tutor experience already really dissipated that, um, I guess, yeah, anxiety about being in charge of people. Yeah, and obviously the marking experience, that was helpful, <laughs> having had that already. Yeah. Yeah, because of that, there's a bit of an element of tutoring that's embedded in the PD for Maxine's position, you want someone who's got a little bit of experience with that, so it's not a shock, uh, and they can perform that role with some experience and integrity as well. Mm. But I think, having said, you said earlier that it's usually your first students that had already been on the tour, mm. I think there's parts of personalities you pick up in that environment that you can kind of select pretty smartly mm. Mm. for years to come, yeah. Yeah, can you elaborate a bit more on South Korean work culture and how that may or may not affect <coughs> environment and sustainability that yeah. comes in South Korea? <laughs> yeah, there's an element of Confucianism in there. Uh, there's an element of South Korea when it was an authoritarian garrison state. So it's a very regimented work culture where people work long hours, even beyond what their mandated work day is. And there's, there's a cultural expectation that people stay on and put in. Mm. And then after it, they go and drink soju with each other several nights a week to improve camaraderie and, uh, and demonstrate their loyalty to the team. And this takes a toll on people's lives. You know, this is 16, 17 hours out of people's days. These are people with families. These are people trying to live lives. And that builds on a, an educational culture where uh, kids from primary school level are doing their normal school day plus four hours of cram school on either side of the official school day. So this whole cult, I'm really critical of it, I wouldn't work in South Korea for all the money in the universe. Uh, because it just, it, and there's demonstrable mental health outcomes that come from this higher suicide rate in the OECD, alcoholism rates that are really sky high, domestic violence rates that are really sky high. Uh, and then this model is so rapacious in how it just exploits ecological systems and the reification of development. You kind of understand it given where South Korea came from a couple, two mm -hmm. generations ago, it was, you know, trying to reconstruct from a war that destroyed the place uh, as a really 
uh, baseline developing country. Uh, so there's a pride in the, the achievements of that development, but it's also hit a wall. Uh, and you can see that in the types of stresses that people are under. And those stresses were part of that movement against Park Geun Hye. That protest movement late last year and early this year was ostensibly about the removal of a corrupt president, but it was also a rebellion against the, the big corporate conglomerates, the Chebol, and the kind of culture that they practice and the pressures that that puts you know, ecological and social on the people. Uh, so it's, it's a really interesting time where that, that old developmental state model is really hitting a wall in a lot of ways. And the, the kind of reactions, the kind of innovations to get around that are some of the things that we were seeing in our site. Mm -hmm. yeah, one, two, three, yeah. Can I, I want to follow up on Victor's question. Is, is there an explicit link between the sort of environmental or sustainable movement and a recognition of how that fits into kind of a much greater systemic change in how people live and consume and, and work? And, or is that something that's just sort of more sort of, um, I guess, implicit and nuanced? But yeah, is that an explicit link that people make? Okay. I think the consumer society is a really big issue. Um, you know, one experience I had was talking to a young woman who was 27 or something working stupid hours and I was telling her about my life and she was like, that's so beautiful, but I love money too much. You know, <laughs> so just unashamed about it. Um, and so they see, you know, the difference, you know, they compare themselves to North Korea and think that's the alternative if we're not like this. So um, it's a total false dichotomy, but that is what their reality is and they're, they're taught to behave like this and I think... It's a perpetuating problem where the more consumerous behaviours they have, the worse it gets. I think, um, and I didn't. I don't know. I, I, I kind of. I was talking to another young woman who told me that she decided not to have children because that would make her a slave. Um, because yeah, their outlook on their life is pretty dismal. But they don't make the connection necessarily between their approach to money, exactly. But it, yeah, I think that makes them completely blind to the environmental movement, which would involve winding back the development and their opportunities. There are some people that get it, but that's still a very small <laughs> grassroots movement. But it, it's happening, like it's happening everywhere else in the world because of some similar problems. Uh, and it's starting to gather momentum, but it's still very nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, okay. Also, following on from what your conversation Victor, I'm just wondering if there's any kind of population policy in place in South Korea and uh, whether that population growth that was spoke of feeding into urbanisation and gobbling up land on the outskirts of cities. Uh, is this related to population growth due to increasing longevity or is it specifically to the fertility rates? And is there any policy in place to refers to that? It's not an explicit population policy. I mean, the birth rate's really low, it's a bit like Japan, but for some of the reasons that we've been talking about. Mm. Uh, but there is a policy to try and decentralise government and business functions away from Seoul. I mean, Seoul is such an exercise, is such a centripetal pull on the South Korean economy. It's by far the biggest urban centre. Uh, you know, most of the GDP happens there. So the government, for example, set up this uh, satellite city called Sejong City, which is about two hours south, and they sent a whole lot of government department and uh, bureaucratic uh, organs down there to have their offices and then set up the subway line, so it went down there. Uh, that's had some issues because it separated the bureaucracy from the decision makers. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, you can imagine some of the, the inefficiencies that come with that. But it was a response to the population pressure that was in Seoul. So I think, yeah, the, the population pressure of people wanting to live in Seoul is, is the real issue uh, at this point. Yeah. Well, most of the people we met um, actually lived more than an hour out of Seoul, mm. so commuted both ways each day, to over two hours a lot. It's pretty nuts. But also, a lot of Korea looks like that, so a lot of it is uninhabitable, yeah. um, which again kind of makes the problem worse. Mm. Um, yeah, well, a couple of questions, completely unrelated. One about the administration, because Alex is running to, to the in here now as well. Mm. So, are there opportunities to do this on a broader scale? So, following up from, from what James was saying, um, that you can create opportunities to travel to different places. So, is there, which is surprising, is there 
institutional support for this, or is this just a one-time follow-up to what you mm -hmm. were doing? Um, also about the selection of places, you've been to China first, now Korea, now you're going to mm -hmm. India, so are there certain preferences what the university supports? And the other question is about uh, Korea and about the um, conservation initiatives. But there were some things that resemble my experience in Singapore where I spent mm -hmm. the last couple mm -hmm. of years. And in Singapore, conservation was often that we turn things into something green, but we tame the wild, don't want wild nature anymore, but we make it as green as possible so that urban folks can still enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, so, is there something, something similar going on when I saw the bird sanctuary that's going to be built for development? So, all the wild places gone, but probably Rio Tinto or whoever is involved will have to commit to building a few lakes here and there and some parts. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the city, the apartments next to that bird sanctuary. Yeah, this is like Max said, this is a, a green city. So called, and it's got those lakes and it's got those parks in it, and it's got uh, high tech urban waste systems, and it's like it's purported to be this green utopia uh, that's built on <laughs> actual green space. <laughs> so, yeah, the, what you're describing in Singapore is exactly the kind of thing uh, that uh, the South Korean government thinks is a good idea because it's green development, there's money to be made in transforming the uh, more natural ecological spaces into a managed green space, uh, whereas there's no money to be made in preserving real ecosystems. Mm. I think it was worse in China. Um, the parks we visited were so kind of well manicured, you couldn't walk on the grass or you couldn't touch anything, um, whereas here it was a little bit more grimy and, um, you know, natural, I think, mm. slightly more so. Yeah, but in, in relation to your first question about the admin, when we first started in 2015, there wasn't a code for it. We just used a, a shell code uh, from, the, uh, from the school. Uh, last year, we set up the Pol 3 ESC code, so it was a dedicated Pol subject, which was good because it unlocked OS help loan uh, abilities for the students to finance it, and we didn't have to get external funding from elsewhere. For next year and beyond, uh, the college has set up a bunch of shell codes specifically for short program travel subjects. Uh, there was some uh, bureaucratic jockeying uh, of the heated kind about what these would look like and what the ILOs and all that stuff would, would be about. Some of you have heard the fun I had negotiating through that. Uh, but what that means is, is that we can plug in any kind of tour into this. So really, if you wanted to run a tour uh, to somewhere in Southeast Asia, the code is there uh, and you could plug into it and use it. And we've tried to make the, uh, the assessment requirements and all of the SIM stuff that's embedded in it sufficiently open uh, that you can tailor it in the way that you want it. Uh, our tour choices for China and South Korea came from that was my interest area and that's where I had connections and I'm sure that's the same for you. Yeah, I didn't have too, we didn't have too much difficulty setting up the one to India. Mm. We did get delayed a little bit by the changes to the new codes, but they seem fairly supportive. Mm. And I chose India because it's my research interest and there's no dedicated course on India or South Asia mm. that I could find anywhere in the university. So mm. I started a new job here as, as a India specialist. I thought it made sense. So this was actually the only way I could start a course. On India, it was actually easier, actually easier to take students there than it is to set it up here, which is kind of bizarre. So that's what we did. Yeah. But the discussions that we've both had with Gwenda, uh, we want to have one short program travel subject a year from the, the Paul and IR program, so it's up to us to negotiate who takes one if they want to do it. Uh, and maybe set up a rotation if we've got a state. I'll do one next year. I might up a three position. I might get a chance to do it again in a year or two. Yeah, yeah. If you so, want to take some like to the So that's something that, like, in department, you can't negotiate. You've got to be ready for action if you want to take one of these things. So we've got time for one more question if anyone's got one. Any thoughts from the students? It was brilliant. <laughs> I bought like a GoPro, like only for the purpose to like capture footage for the actual <laughs> video presentation. So, yeah, that so that was a good investment. But <laughs> 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 overall, like um, 
it was just very um, satisfying to actually be immersed in a culture that's very different to your own and like having that immersion has actually sparked an interest in me to learn more about um, South Korea and North Korea and the overall situation in terms of the environment. It's obviously these sorts of um, chances um, they spark um, within you interest you thought you didn't have prior so it's so you end up learning more about yourself mm. through them so it's highly recommended. Yeah and just like reflecting on Liam's experience this was Liam's first trip overseas yeah. and to see when you got back and you had the glow of confidence and wisdom and experience <laughs> when you returned the, the growth experience that you had was so amazing to see and that's the kind of thing uh, that's really satisfying as the, the tour leader to see people go through that process. So, yeah, that's probably, a, and have you got anything to add before we wind up? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thanks for coming today. I uh, really appreciate the questions. And good luck to Alex as you go on this journey mm -hmm. in the coming months. Yeah.